What's up? Yo. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the keynote at the Apple Developer Conference today. And Setting times. Yeah, man. I don't I I was like overwhelmed. I was too. This was uh definitely the best WWDC I've seen in several years. And since we were going to be talking, I was taking some notes during this one, which was kind of good, actually. It was kind of a like instant reflection moment during WWDC. But something that I noticed was, especially when we got to iOS, like Mac and iOS, I could not type fast enough. I know. They've got so good, too, at when they do the demos of like sneaking in all these other little things that they yeah. didn't have time to talk about separately. You so know, true. things like they're on the watch demo and they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, I can just look at Find My Friends app, which is now happening, and remind myself to, you know, check in with my wife about the apples from the grocery store later. I don't know. They just yeah, kind of... They I could definitely tell that they, uh, yeah, they didn't have, they didn't have enough time to fit it all in. I could tell that there was so much more they could have done a, a demo on, but um, it was kind of amazing too how perfectly they had it fit into three hours or two hours. Yeah, it was like really down to the minute almost. Yeah, it was. Yeah, they rehearse. They rehearse those things. Much more than last year's. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty bad. Although I will say the. The mu- well, should we should we go in order? I was going to say something about Apple Music, but should we go in order of the event? Is that a logical way to try to? I feel like I feel like that makes sense. I don't know how else to keep keep on task with all the stuff. I, me neither. <sighs> so, for the people who listen to this podcast who don't know what the de- Apple WWDC is, it's a developer conference for the people who make apps. You're one of those people. I am, yes. I guess I should do an introduction. Yeah. Who yeah, are you? So I'm, I'm Courtney. I work at a, a, uh, an agency called Prolific Interactive up in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And like Robbie said, we build apps. Uh, we're about 100 people. Um, we do mostly iOS and Android, but um, some really interesting things have been happening recently with tvOS coming out. Um, we've also been doing some some stuff that makes me feel like I'm in one of those, uh, you know, like 10 years ago, you'd see the stock photography of, of like what they thought the future would look like, where they had like the fake looking tablet things and like all sorts of weird monitors around you. Yeah. Well, uh, we've been doing a lot of things that make me feel like that. Like we've been getting into VR, um, which definitely like when you have your coworkers have VR headsets on around you, you, you definitely feel like you're in some strange version of the future. And then, uh, we're working on this one app for this uh, custom window company that like has this giant touchscreen TV that like lets you uh, design custom windows on, and it's like basically like an iPad table. Anyway, so that's what I do. I didn't know your team was so big. Yeah, yeah, we've grown a lot since I, I went since I got there. We were like fifty people, and now we're at a hundred. So wow, you've doubled. Yes, <laughs> quickly. All right. Well, at another time, we should probably talk about VR because that sounds really interesting that you're doing. It that. is. Also, I it must is. say that I would really love an iPad table. Well, you, we pretty much have one. It just runs Android, so it's not very iPad-y. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So that's who you are. Um, so Apple, when they do a developer conference, uh, they do a keynote, which is kind of for the public, and. Um, we are going to kind of dissect some of the features of the new software updates that they announced today, which will be out all in the fall. Um, So they've got four operating systems now. They've got one on the watch. They've got one on the Apple TV, one on the Mac, and one on iOS. And they, I think they gave, they discussed a pretty substantial update for all of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, they start. They talked about the watch first. We both have Apple watches, so I guess we should probably talk about that. Did, what did you think of the updates to the Apple Watch OS? Yeah, I'm just excited for uh, the moment when using my watch isn't a pain. Basically, <laughs> um, I love my watch and I use it every day. 
but just more and more recently, like, you know, it, we, I've, we've had it for over a year now, I guess. And so the honeymoon phase is long gone. And there's just so many times when I'm just trying to do my normal day stuff and I'm in a hurry and I just can't end a workout because my hand is sweaty or the watch is wet. And it just takes me like literally, I know this sounds stupid, but like a minute to like end the workout. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's it, enough. It feels to- like a minute. <laughs> It does, it does, and it's like that's enough to make me just stop using the thing. So, anyways, when I was watching, uh, you know, watching the keynote today, there were so many moments that made me realize, like, oh, it's not going to be a pain soon. <laughs> even even after they, because the first thing they announced was like just that they're going to introduce this new thing where apps like that you use a lot will it'll it'll learn those apps and it'll like refresh the information on them. And somehow it will allow you to, when you tap to launch it, it'll just instantly show you an up-to-date version of the app, like with no loading time, it seemed. I was very impressed. Honestly, they could have stopped there, and I would have been pretty pleased. If it, I mean, if it works as they showed it, I mean, it's they're, they're, the apps are painfully slow. Like, they're slower currently than iPhone apps. Mm-hmm. And if the whole point of the watch is to save time and be more out of the way than taking a phone out of your pocket it's oftentimes accomplishing the opposite when you're holding your wrist up and staring at a spinning wheel for it it really feels like eternity but it's like i don't know seven eight nine seconds um but now if these apps work like they demoed i mean he would he would launch he launched i think some kind of like football app and it was just like immediately on the screen fully loaded with it didn't need to like have a second loading time to refresh the, the information on the screen. Like it was just completely fresh. You know, I mean, it's going to, I don't know. I just feel like that's going to make the watch what I originally envisioned it to be. Yeah, I agree. There was no, there was no spinner and it was just like right into the app and you're right. Like everyone in the room that had a watch, it was like, all right, you, you sold me again. <laughs> Yeah, I think they said it. it's going to feel like a whole new watch. I really hope that it does. Me too. Um, yeah, it seems like they've kind of, um, like before there was glances, which were like these super quick, like they were actually fast, but they were like kind of stunted versions of the app. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you had like full apps that were really slow. And it kind of seems like we've met in the middle with, uh, I'm really glad they rethought what the side button does. Um because it's kind of like halfway in between the glance and a full app. So like when you tap the side button, you get something that looks like a glance, but it's like your most used apps. Um, and even from those views, you can see like the refreshed information. And then if you want to go all the way into the app, you can just tap on it and it's like immediately you're in the app. So it's not like you have to go from glance to tapping to being in, you know, waiting for a while and then being in the app. So that looks like a really good, um, I don't know, it just seems like they've been listening to users and, you know, finding a good balance there. Yeah, when uh, that side button, I'm going to go from never touching it ever to it's going to probably be the button that I use the most. Yeah, exactly. I'm really glad they – I'm surprised they made that big of a jump. Um, like I know it's a funny word to use, but like jumps like that are very brave because you know you, you went out on your – you went out on a limb to, to change what a hardware button does. I mean I, don't, I can't think of uh, almost any time that they fundamentally changed what a hardware button does in the recent history, like they've added things like the, like they've added the ability to like take a picture with the volume button, but it's not like they like changed the volume button, you know? Yeah. I think it's, it's pretty refreshing that they're able to realize, wow, we messed up and we can fix this. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm definitely really excited for the, uh, those changes. The only thing that I've been wanting since day one is for the side button to change contextually based on like what app you're using. Um, especially like, like if I'm going to work out, like I don't want to use my watch at all. I'm just working out. Um, so for that reason, I really wish the side button would just like, you know, start and stop a run or something like that. Yeah. I, so I, my Apple watch had to go to the shop about three or four months ago and I put on my old pebble watch for Mm -hmm. that time. And you know, it's, it doesn't do like, 1% 1% of the things that the Apple Watch does, but there were yeah. these little moments of like 
way less friction than I deal with on the Apple Watch. Like, mm. and, and, and in ways where, like, there's a couple, there are some people who were developing for it that, like, there were a couple of things I could do on it that I couldn't even do in my Apple Watch, or I could do them, but better. Like, uh, you, Uber has an app on Pebble, and I was kind of playing around in the app, and I was like, wow, this looks horrible, but <laughs> I can navigate it with the hardware buttons without looking at my watch. And every time I touch a button, the next screen instantly loads because it's just this mm -hmm. like cheapo little e-ink display. Yeah. So, and, and then, oh, and they've got a Nest app for your thermostat and I just like touch the hardware buttons up and down to change the temperature of my house. And I don't know, nice. it, it's kind of refreshing, but um, I, I mean, I think with the speed improvements, I'm going to be one back over to the Apple Watch. I mean, and, and because everything it claims to do is more convenient and impressive than the competition. Mm -hmm. It's just that it does not really deliver in actual convenience. So let me ask you this. Are the glances going away, do you think? Or are they being replaced? I'm not sure. There was a couple, there's three things that I've been wondering if they're going away. One was glances. Two was like quick access to friends and like, which is what the side hardware button got replaced with the, uh, you know, the most recent apps. And then lastly, I saw a few people on Twitter talking about like, there's no more like, uh, like circles view, like for the, like seeing all of your apps. Like we didn't see that at all during the presentation. So I'm assuming that's still there if I tap on the digital crown, but oh, they didn't show that. Yeah, I'm definitely assuming that like the app screen where you hit the yeah the digital crown. I'm assuming that that like grid of circles is still there, and th that which which makes sense because honestly, I, I felt like prior to this event that that screen needed to be rethought. But mm -hmm. if truly this new method of navigating your most used apps with the other hardware button if i mean if it's really that convenient and easy and smart where i'm only really launching an app from that giant home screen of unorganized circles like if i'm only doing that every now and then to get to something but then my more heavily used stuff is like always on reserve mm -hmm. i don't know i feel like that's appropriate that they keep it that way i mean i, I still feel like if you know i, I want to be able to get to all those apps just maybe like, it's not a terrible interface if you have to interact with it every now and then. Yeah, I guess that's true, but I just couldn't get over the fact that it didn't show it at all, which to me means, like, you know, I'm thinking, like, when we present something to a partner, it's like, well, if, you, if you're still working on something, you don't show it. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking, like, well, maybe it's in the works, and it's it won't be the circles anymore. Like, maybe there will be... Like, it makes sense there needs to be sort of, like, an, a, some sort of landing page of... Get your know, dashboard of apps you can kind of quickly get around to, but I'm not convinced that it's going to be the circles anymore. Yeah, I mean they could like if they announce a new watch, like in the fall, they could release an update to the to the new watch OS that mm -hmm. has. Well, it won't even have been released probably by then. So I mean, they, yeah, they could just announce new features. Yeah, I don't know. That'll be interesting to see. Um, the other thing I was going to say was was cool was um. Because, you know, recently uh, Google had their keynote for developers, and they um, they had this, like, kind of like a swipe to text feature on their mm -hmm. Android. Uh, what is their Android Wear is their watch operating system. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that that, I thought, like, wow, that doesn't look fun to have an entire keyboard jammed <laughs> on a little screen. But yeah. But a little part of me thought, but actually, like, if I were really in a pinch, I would probably try to use that. <laughs> yeah. Mostly because uh, Siri is so finicky on the Apple Watch that I would almost rather take a try to use a little micro keyboard than trust my watch to transcribe what I say. So anyway, Apple has this kind of a, their own solution to it, which is like you can... So you can sort of draw the words on the letters on the watch face and it'll turn them into text, which I think is awesome. Yeah, it'll be interesting. They call it scribble, which will obviously uh, necessitate brevity because you're doing one, le one letter at a time. But um, it seems like it'd be easier because even, even now, and I don't even have big hands, but even now, anytime I touch the screen, it's like you cover most of everything. So it kind of makes sense that they're doing one letter at a time. 
Yeah, I think it's smart. And Aiden can do Chinese. That's crazy. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, I feel like they throw that stuff in to just, like, make you go, wow. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We don't have to talk about everything. I have, like, literally every announcement bullet pointed. There was some stuff that was interesting, but not, like... I think that's the major stuff that seemed cool mm -hmm. to me. Oh. Yeah, let me, let me look through my... My watch, my watch notes, because there was a few things that I thought were would like significantly change how I used it. Oh, fitness apps can run in the background. That is going to be important to me because I do use a bunch of different fitness apps. I and, know you do. Yeah, and I've until this point, there are times where I want to use them natively on the watch versus on the phone, and I really just don't know what they're doing. Like, like I'll think to myself, okay, I want to run. Um, pedometer plus plus um it mm -hmm. has its own feature where you can like me you can basically like measure a, a walk workout and i'm just left with so many questions like can that walk okay obviously that walking workout is feeding the workout in the step counter in my iphone's health app but mm -hmm. is it able to fill the green ring for me is mm. it um able to, i know it's able to sense my heart rate but then it does weird stuff like I'm not entirely sure that fitness apps running in the background is a 100% new idea because there would be times where I would try to do a walking workout with pedometer plus plus and I would go back to the watch face and it would show the little green running dude in the upper hmm. part of it. Like, and if I would tap it, it would take me back into pedometer plus plus. So I don't know. I was both excited and a little confused about this announcement because it seems like to some extent fitness apps can already do that kind of stuff. Um, hmm. But I don't know. I'm just hoping like, I think that kind of, that's just kind of exciting because health, health apps make so much sense on the watch. Like I just don't like when I go to the gym, I, I have this fitness app that I do for like lifting. And I mean, I'm just constantly like taking it out of my pocket and like yeah. noodling on it. And, and the guy who I work out with is like, really, man, come on, like, let's get this, let's get it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Let's actually work out. <laughs> Um, speaking of fitness apps, I know that you, um, you use Spire, right? Yeah, I love Spire. Yeah, so Spire, uh, do you want to like introduce Spire? And then I was just like curious how, um, what you thought about the Breathe app on the Apple Watch. Okay, so Spire is a little, I don't know how to describe it, like a little pedal. Just a wearable. Thing. Yeah, it's like a wearable thing that you attach to the inside of your belt. And it is able to track your respiratory rate, which it is then able to draw conclusions about your mental state from. Um, so it categorizes your breathing into activity, calm, which is uh, slow, consistent breathing, focus, which is elevated, consistent breathing, and tense, which is kind of an erratic breathing pace and it anytime you're in one of these states for three minutes or more it starts a streak where it will begin to m like kind of measure how many minutes of a streak you have with that type of breathing and it's very cool it, it tracks all of this data in a really cool app that you know has its own set of um, measuring tools and incentives um, it also can send your breaths per minute to a respiratory rate data sheet in the Apple Health app. So you can see your respiratory rate alongside other information. I actually like was at, at the doctor the other day talking about like um, a muscle inflammation issue I have. And we were, I was like, mm -hmm. he, he was super impressed that I had all this data tracked. Like I went sure. down and I said, like I, I have on average for the past six months have breathed 17 breaths a second. And like, I could actually tell him that. <laughs> And he was like, that's amazing. I know. And he was like, that's really normal. And I was like, good, that's good to know. And then I said, my watch tells me that my heart rate is like sometimes 80 when I'm just sitting. And he's like, that's not good. <laughs> hmm. So I don't know. This is really interesting data. And if I can automate it, like with the Spire, you know, I mean, it's awesome. I mean, I'm just, I, all I have to do is charge this thing every couple nights and clip it to my belt. And it's doing all of this tracking automatically. Yeah, so you know they entered. That's that's amazing. I mean, I think that's really cool to be able to have that level of data. Um, 
yeah, I recently had an experience like that where um, I broke my collarbone in the fall, and it was this interesting experience because you know I normally work out you know five to six days a week, um, and just living in New York, just doing tons of walking and lots of activity and burning like a whole lot of calories, and I just like to see like how many calories I burned by the end of the day. And, you know, when I broke my collarbone, it was like my, obviously my activity went like way down. And I was just like, honestly, uh, you know, curious, like, okay, well, how much less calories should I be eating a day based on my, you know, significantly reduced um, activity? And it was so cool to be able to see like, you know, after just a few days of of reduced activity, I could see exactly how many calories less I was burning and could translate that to, you know, maybe one less scoop of ice cream at night. That, yeah. Yeah. That actually is is the funny thing, um, <clears throat> because some of these apps are automated, and then other ones you have to manually input stuff like the calories. And I tend to, at my best, do it all. But the first thing that slips when I start to get out of this consistent pattern of inputting data is always mm-hmm. the, the stuff that I have to manually input. And the things that I manually input are um, nutrition and food, uh, caffeine and water. Now I'm proud to say that my wife and I are supporting the Kickstarter for a water bottle that is shipping to us sometime later this month that has a cap that measures the amount of air in the water and basically can over Bluetooth send to the Apple health app water sheet, like how much water you've been drinking automatically. Oh, wow. Which I'm super stoked about because that's like one less thing I have to tap through throughout my day that's going to automatically happen. So, I mean, at this point, you know, it's it's down to caffeine and, and calories at this point. Definitely. What's the water bottle called? Uh, that's a good question. It's called, I believe it's called Seed. Nice. Um, yep, Seed water bottle. It's a pretty good looking water bottle like it looks like a water bottle i would buy just with it didn't do anything fancy yeah for sure i'm sorry it's an indiegogo not a kickstarter Mm. so um so yeah apple announced a breathe app for the watch and i don't know it seems more like it's a competitor to the a lot of the meditation apps more so than spire well spire Mm -hmm. has some like meditation features in it where you can have someone guide you through some breathing, but honestly, like, I don't know. We're we're actually it's it's really funny you you brought that point up because speaking of health tracking and my wife and I, we have actually, even though we're trying to cut down on all of our digital subscriptions, we are actually considering doing a one year subscription to the app Headspace. Oh yeah, which is. Uh, if you're unaware of it, it is basically like a guided meditation app with, um, I mean, some, and we've, and we've tried a couple of meditation apps, but why this one in particular is so far above the rest is just because the guy's voice and pace to the way that he speaks is actually like mentally like serene and calming in a way that the other apps kind of feel almost automated even though in some cases it's a real actual person speaking like i don't know he's just got a pace that i feel like is always going to draw me towards that style of meditation like guided meditation Mm -hmm. because i think the apple app just basically taps your wrist when you should breathe Mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting it's very obviously it's like very low friction not a lot of features but I found it interesting because um, the stand, the stand alerts have been really good for me. Just because, you know, if you get into it at work, you forget you're sitting for two hours, so it's really nice to get tapped on the wrist. Um, I just liked the UI, like the the two forms of UI. Like one was visual, where you could you could kind of follow the follow the visual of breathing, with that little, um, you know, there's like a little image that kind of pulses to the rhythm of of your the suggested breathing pattern, and then I thought it was pretty cool that there was haptic feedback because, you know, I, I wouldn't stare at the watch. It would be really nice to just, you know, I don't know how exactly they'll do it with haptic feedback, but it's pretty cool that they would be able to tap on you to tell you, like, the rhythm to breathe, which I could see, 
you know, I would close my eyes in that case, which would obviously help a little bit more. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I like it. I'll definitely try it out. Ditto. It'll be funny in the middle of the day, though. <laughs> it's like I'm going to look like I'm doing yoga like 20 times a day. Yeah. I hesitate to use that kind of stuff in public. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a ton of stuff I hesitate to do with my technology in public. Very true. Um, I had a couple. I had, sorry, yeah. No, go ahead. Um, one thing I just wanted to call out was the uh, man from day one. I always thought reminders would be on the app, and it finally is. And I'm very excited because my watch is like my number one place where I add items to my grocery list, especially because like. You know, you can do it with, hey, Siri, you can do it in the middle of cooking. You don't have to touch anything. You can just say, hey, Siri, add eggs to the grocery list. So now it'll be really nice because there are times when I want to check to see what's on the grocery list first or I just want to check something off. So that's really cool that you'll finally be able to actually do that on the watch. Yeah, I agree. I'll probably use that at the grocery store. Yeah, that's really um, nice. And I will, I will definitely use a Find My Friends app. Like, even if I just glance at it to see where my wife is on a map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that app is, I have one person in it, which is my wife, so I call it Find My Wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually have, uh, I have an, a number of people who have opted into letting me follow their location, and I don't know, yeah. I, think, I think it's cool. I don't think it's creepy. I don't think it's creepy either, and I honestly wish I had it with literally everyone I know, because like with my coworkers, like being in New York, like we're constantly like meeting somewhere, meeting at the, the partner's office, and I'm like, God, I just want to know like, where are they, you know? Yeah, it's very simple. That'll be a cool one. Um, should we move on to the TV? I think so. But uh, there were so many improvements to watch OS. I think it, it warranted a little bit of uh, hashing through. Totally. I'm, I might, I think in like actual practice of how it's going to change the way I interact with my Apple stuff, I feel like that's one of the bigger announcements of the day was the watch stuff. Definitely. I just want that platform to be good so much. Like I really believe. I agree. <laughs> I'm very hopeful. You know, I really believe in TV too, but I have to say like I was least impressed with the TV. Yeah, I have like stuff. four points. <laughs> so the thing that, let's see, I'm going to just spout off the things that I think are going to definitely change the way I interact with the TV. Um, YouTube search. Mm -hmm. um, single sign-on would be like where the thing that like allows you to sign on to your cable provider once, and then it, d it does it for all across all of your different apps. Like I don't, I I don't know. I kind of like I've had my Apple TV for almost like six or seven months, like I, I already did that. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good, good for new users. Um, dark mode will be great. It's like that Apple TV is like blinding in a dark room. Yeah, it should um, probably just be dark mode. <laughs> yeah, it really should. Um, I, I'm interested for what HomeKit can do. Uh, but honestly, like the thing that I was that I was hoping for, there were actually two things I was hoping for that didn't happen. And they got so close. Like they, one of the major announcements was that the iPhone remote app is now going to do all the stuff that the physical remote can do. Like you can tell Siri to launch game of Thrones or something like this, and it'll do it on your Apple TV. But I just thought it was so obvious and I'm just, I guess, I guess next, maybe next year, but like, it's so obvious to me that every Siri device should be capable of m controlling an Apple TV. Mm -hmm. Like, like why do I have to be in the iPhone remote app to just say to my watch, I could just, when I could just say to my watch, like, hey, Siri, I want to watch last week tonight and then have it turn on the TV, switch to the right HDMI, and then, like, just launch right into the most recent episode on HBO Now. I see what you're saying. So you don't think that you should have the additional task of, like, going to the app first. Right. Like, I just feel like they're so close. Like, why couldn't they just build it into my watch? Yeah, I guess I didn't think of that, but that is kind of an extra step. I can live with it. The other thing that they didn't announce, which is surprising because they announced it for the Mac, is picture in picture. Where hmm, that's true. You could like you know make the the video feed from one app minimize into the lower left or right corner or something, and then like continue to 
do other stuff on the TV. Mm. So those are the things I was hoping for, and I did not get it either of them. But the YouTube search, I will probably use every day. Yeah, that'll be really nice. And I also like the uh, – we search by topic a lot for movies. Um, so that was a nice little call out because there's – usually my default answer to what do you want to watch tonight is is uh, sci-fi. So I'll enjoy <laughs> searching for sci-fi movies. I'm glad to hear you say that because when they said – when he did the demo where he searched for like 80s high school movies, <laughs> I thought to myself like I'm never going to use this. Yeah, but then, uh, yeah, I was like, nope, sci-fi. Also, um, like, uh, the way that I interact with with media is, I don't know, I'm just very decisive. Like, I generally know what I'm looking for. Like, Mm -hmm. any anything that could be thought of as a discovery feature is generally not as interesting to me. Actually, you can, if you're listening to this show, you can refer to episode five, where Alan Georgia and I talk about. Uh, algorithms for discovery in relationship to streaming music services and Twitter feeds. Um, boom. Boom. But I don't know. I, I just, it's cool that you would use it. I just don't think I would ever, I don't know. I just want it to like the interface to be smoother with Siri. Like so many times I feel like I should be able to like sit down and just, like, like the TV knows what I do, and I, I really do very few things. Like, there, there are months that pass where all I do on the Apple TV is I get home from work, and I want to watch the most recent ep- full-length episode of The Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like that's a chore. Like, like I, if I say, like, I want to watch The Walking Dead, I almost want it, to, by default, to just, like, start showing me the most recent episode. But I, instead, mm-hmm. I, like, it shows me the show, and then I have to select... I buy it on iTunes. I do a, an iTunes subscription. So I have to like click that I want to watch it on iTunes versus Netflix. And then I have to like scroll through like if I I haven't watched all of the the episodes all the way through, so like it by default positions me to like the most like lo, like the oldest episode that I haven't finished watching. So like now like some episode from season 3 is selected and I have to like scroll all the way to the right to find the most recent episode. And then all the extra iTunes content is mixed in with the episodes. And and now I'm finding myself taking out my phone and Google searching the title of the most recent episode (laughs) so that I can actually, because they're not like labeled with episode numbers. They're just labeled all titles. So like, I don't know. It's just a mess. Like I just want to sit down and and watch some zombies. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe uh, next year's WWDC. I hope so. Oh, another thing that would be cool is a watch list, like some place where you could aggregate all like right now, like I'm watching, we're watching like Game of Thrones on HBO. Now we watch Amy Schumer's show on iTunes and like a couple of other things. Like, I just feel like if those are the things that are that I'm watching now, it would be really cool to basically just create some sort of app on the home screen where you could like just get like a feed of all the shows Hmm. that you follow. Interesting. That would be cool. But instead, we got dark mode. So Dark mode. <laughs> uh, I think the number one thing I, I wrote down in my notes was remote app. Maybe it's better than the remote. That's my, uh, <laughs> my synopsis of tvOS. <laughs> I don't hate the, the physical remote as much as it seems the rest of the tech world does. But you know what? It, and I do feel like it has too, too many buttons. It is, I, you know, it's a lot of buttons, and <laughs> the thing that my wife and I always tend to screw up is it's just very delicate. You're like, your your toe will <laughs> will will like scrub ten minutes back in the in the movie. Yeah. Well, at least they changed it so that now you have to like pause it first before you can scrub the movie. Yeah, it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> Actually, when they first made that change, I thought that. I didn't know what happened. I didn't know how to scroll, like how to Me scrub neither. through it anymore. Yeah. So the so the room. I actually figured it out. Like I tried to think about like all the different things that ha- all the buttons do. Like if you hold it or double tap it or triple tap it or whatever. And I'm I'm pretty sure that you you could definitely condense the function of those six buttons into five buttons, and you can almost 
condense that function into four buttons. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, there needs to be some sort of like home button, which honestly, just like an iPhone, it could also function as a Siri button if you hold it. It could mm-hmm. function as a multitasker if you double tap it. Um, I understand the need for play pause, but the pressing in the middle of the trackpad also pauses. So I don't know why that is necessary. Mm-hmm. The only other thing you really need is that menu button, which just kind of is like a back button universally. And I, and I just feel like if you hold it, if you tap it, it like goes back a screen. If you hold it, it goes to the home screen. Boom. Done. Yeah. Four buttons. Those two, yeah. The hierarchy buttons are the ones that always trip me up. I'm always accidentally going like back to the, like Apple TV home screen when I just meant to go back like one level and then vice versa. I mean to go back to the home screen, but I go back one level in the app and those ones are confusing. Yeah. So, I digress. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe the iPhone remote will be better and more clear what does what. Yeah. The last thing I, I think it will be really cool is the automatic downloads that that might seem like so obvious, but, um, just like from my perspective, like one of the one of the major hurdles is always going to be getting new users to use one of your products, and um, so it'll be so great to like if you're working with a partner that you know they maybe they've had an iPhone or iPad app for years, but we work on a TV app for them. It's really hard with a, you know a user that's already got their habits ingrained. They're used to watching you know PBS on their iPad or whatever. Um, you know, to get them to, to go and like, you know, start their new habit on the Apple TV will be so much easier just skipping the whole download process and they just see it in front of them. That'll be a, I think that'll be a really big win for kind of pushing the, you know, I know they said that, you know, Apple TV is all about apps last year. And I think it's been a little bit hard just because it's like this whole new pathway for a lot of people. So I think that'll help kind of retrain people where to find their content. Yeah. That makes sense to me. That's well, all that's I've all got I for got. TV. Yep, that's all <laughs> yeah. I got. I was <laughs> me too. so pumped when they started talking about the Mac, which is now no longer OS ten. It is now Mac OS, lowercase M A C capital O S. You're right. It's exciting. Very exciting. Um, I thought so, they uh, I thought they missed an opportunity. Like they've been they always joke about the names. Um, and I thought after he had talked about like the marketing people getting high or whatever and naming uh, that thing they did last year, I think they should have introduced it as computer OS just to like mess with people. <laughs> that would have been good. Or like Macintosh OS or something, something ridiculous. Computer OS would have been good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I was super impressed here. So my two major notes are on the continuity stuff and the iCloud drive stuff. Mm-hmm. Which, I knew you were going to talk about the iCloud drive stuff. Oh, I know. Another another reference. I'll have to link in this. Uh, and when I post this episode up, I'll have to put a link to the. Um, I did a blog post about my all the issues I've had with iCloud Drive like a year ago. And oh gosh, um, yeah, it's been working better for me. But I, I I don't know. Every every time they do, an, it seems like they're taking iCloud Drive very seriously um what they introduced the thing that they introduced that i feel like was the obvious way that icloud drive should have originally been implemented was when they said that they're going to automatically take your documents folder and your desktop and just sync it across all of your apple devices Mm -hmm. and i was like that's exactly how it should work yes finally like in fact so real quick do they is it the I know they said the desktop, but they said the documents folder I'm, too. I'm pretty sure they did. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. That was sure. the one I wasn't. I thought they said it, but I, for some reason I was like, I don't think they just said that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. So, and here's the thing. Like, if, they, if they're going to do that, which I think, it's, I think it's perfect. I honestly think, like, they should just ditch the iCloud Drive folder and just all like documents should just be the iCloud drive folder. Like why Mm -hmm. abstract it? Like they're documents. You put them in doc. I mean, I'm probably, honestly, I will probably just start putting on, if the, if the documents and desktop folder both sync, I will probably just go back to using my computer like a crazy person again and just leave junk everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's going to be fantastic. Uh, Yeah, that's true. 
so I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I'm a, a, when they talked about it, I was a little bit bummed that they didn't address collaboration. Like I, I really feel like the iCloud Drive apps, especially iWork, can really like I would love to be able to use Pages or Keynote like a Google Drive app. Yeah. Um, you kind of can do it if both people are on the website. But I would love to honestly like this is where Apple is is so like they're so good at software design. Like I just feel like it would be awesome if I could share a link to a file I have a Pages file with you and we could both be in the Pages app on our Macs and just mm-hmm. be editing the same thing from a non like a totally native OS 10 app. I'm sorry, Mac OS app. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's still a lot to be desired there. They're also doing something like what I got really excited a month ago when Dropbox announced that they're gonna make Dropbox able to basically um, store, like, show you all of your documents in the Finder, but yet not all of them are actually on your computer until you actually double click it to launch the file. Like, that's awesome. And I, they announced pretty much that exact same thing with iCloud Drive that it's gonna mm-hmm. optimize your storage based on old, you know, which files are older and are opened less often, I suppose they're just going to kind of take them offline and they'll show you the thumbnail and the finder, but they won't actually be occupying space on your hard drive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, Apple Pay on the web. Gosh, I mean, even just having like one password a couple taps away to like input my credit card information into websites, Apple Pay on the web is going to like be one crazy step further where all I'm going to have to do when I'm buying something on a website is just basically like look at my watch and tap a confirm button to pay for stuff everywhere. Yeah, that's pretty gnarly. Um, Not to mention that the Apple Watch will be able to unlock your Mac without a password. Yeah, I think think that's the one I put the most exclamation points by. (laughs) I was pretty pumped. Yeah, I was like, dude, that, okay, so I had two things on that. Number one, I think that's the best way they could possibly sell Apple Watches to people. (laughs) It's just like, you can get in your Mac with this. And secondly, I was like really thinking about it. And I was like, okay, think about how many, think how many people work in offices, or not just in offices, think about how many people are working every day with Macs. If you combined all of the time it takes people to type passwords every single day, I mean, you're, we're going to be getting, like, trillions of hours over the course of a, a year in America with, like, the amount of time saved by everyone using a Mac every day. Yeah. Well, I guess that's only for Apple Watch users, though. Totally, so maybe, totally true. Maybe but not a trillion yet. I, it was, you're right, though, about the, the sales thing. Like, that's totally the kind of thing that makes owning the watch so, like, the value of it so obvious. It's like, of course yeah. I'm wearing this thing. And it's close to my computer, you know. And I, yeah, I, I hate typing in my password, and that is just gonna not be a part of my life anymore. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, oh, and universal clipboard. So now, so I was, I this. So there are a bunch of apps on the App Store that you can like copy something on your iPhone and then paste it from the Mac. They're all the worst. They are all pretty bad. But the thing that like. <laughs> This feature seems so obvious to me, but it wasn't until they did the demo where he like basically like was in, using a drawing app. I think it was like it looks like it was um pro, like Procreate or something, and it, you yeah, know, it was. basically just like dragged and like highlighted a bunch of assets on the iPad. Like he basically like did a drawing on the iPad and then like highlighted a bunch of the artwork that he just drew and then hit the copy button. And then went over to a keynote presentation on his Mac, and then hit the paste button, and it like made that thing he just drew the background of a slide. Yeah, that's that's insane. It's like our clipboard is now in the cloud. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty exciting. It is because you know I use, um, you know, we're both iPad Pro lovers, and uh, I mean it's been completely changing a lot of different things I do. And I mean, compared to my the previous iPad that I owned, it's like the iPad Pro is completely like a content creation device, whereas before it was always consuming on it. 
So the thought of being able to uh, to just move like it's almost it's almost like I'm trying to think of an example. It's kind of like you know how no matter what feature is in an app, people will always just like screenshot things and text them to their friends. Yeah. So that's like it's like messages is like the prime example of it doesn't matter sometimes what feature you put in your app. It might even be a good feature, but like you just have to understand like users are going to use the pathway they're used to and just like hack it. And I felt like the universal clipboard was like, like it was kind of like, well, I, I think I'll use it more than the continuity features. Cause like sometimes I'm using the Mac and I'll see the little continuity icons popping up. And I just, for some reason I get like nervous that something's going to like break in between and like half my progress is going to be lost. But I feel like the universal clipboard is like the hacky but more like confident way of like just getting something from one thing to another. Yep. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, it's awesome. Even um, things like like passwords, like I'll totally you I'll totally do that. If I'm like if I have like two devices in front of me, I'll just be like, I'm just gonna copy this over here on my Mac and just paste it onto my phone. Oh, I didn't even think of that. It's so much easier to type a password on a physical keyboard. Exactly. I can like type little passages. I could like type a message to like, I don't know, just type a message to someone on my Mac keyboard and just copy it and then paste it into the body of a message. Yeah. I'm, it's going to be awesome. I'm excited for that one. Um, they announced that they're going to introduce tabs into more apps. Like you can have multiple tabs open in the maps application. And but I'm trying to think of like what, th this is pretty cool. Cause I love tabs. What apps do you think are going to be cool to have multiple tabs open in. Hmm. You know, that one didn't strike me that much, but I I don't know. That one's I feel like is gonna is gonna be bigger than I'm thinking. I mean they made it sound like it was like out of the box too, which is cool. So like I know one app that I'll use this in is um, is for Sketch, um, which is like the main UI tool for like a lot of product designers. Um, like I'm constantly flipping through different windows you know, I have like four or five documents open and it's kind of cumbersome to get to the next one because, you know, you work with them really big. So I use like a hotspot um, in the bottom right corner to like kind of do like the little expo expose or whatever it is where it shows you like all the windows um, for that current app. And it would be amazing to be able to just like tab through all the documents. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. I'm, I'm imagining like that kind of productive work being the kind of situations where that is really noticeable. Like, I mean, even just with like work, um, general like document apps, like um, PDF, actually um, there's a really great app for the Mac called PDF Expert, which already has mm. a multiple tabbed interface for PDFs. And it's so delightful um, that I'm always like banging my head against the wall when I have like two or three keynote presentations open at once or- Yeah, exactly. Just, That's a great app Yeah. for, uh, for multiple tabs. So I don't know. I, f I feel like that could be cool. Like just the general everyday work apps, like having multiple spreadsheets open at the same time. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. I, I don't know. I got kind of excited about tabs. <laughs> I've, I have mixed emotions about tabs. Sometimes I, I love them and sometimes I hate them. Like I can't stand tabs in the finder. I don't know why. Oh, I love them. And I hate the fact that there's no way to set a default setting where like something will open in a new tab. Like you can set a folder when you double click a folder, it'll open in a new tab. But like if you some other way launch a finder window, it'll always open in a separate window. And I actually, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. I had to go into the settings and make a keyboard shortcut that will actually like collapse, like collapse all of my finder windows into one like tabbed interface of different, tabs you know um, yeah but it has this really slow and characteristically apple animation like it has this <laughs> like little swoosh animation where they all sort of like go from the, the foreground into the background and i hate it it makes me angry that's funny you know i go i'm very organized with my my spaces and desktops and hot corners and all that but for some reason i just love like ten thousand finder windows in front of me <laughs> That's, that's hilarious. I, I can't tolerate it. <laughs> that's funny. 
Um, Siri is coming to the Mac. Very exciting. Yeah, I think I'm going to, like, I don't know. It's not, I'm not that excited about it, but I, I do think I'm going to use it pretty regularly. Um, especially if Siri, and I'm not sure this was, a left un, this was left unclear, but I'm, if Siri is able to sort of, like, sort of be something that's in the cloud and not something that is specific to which device you're on, hmm. um, that could be really powerful. Like, I would love to tell my, my Mac, hey, I just drank... 24 ounces of, of water, even though my cool water bottle is going to like negate the need to do this. But I, I'd love to be able to say um, to my to my Mac, you know, like I just drank 24 ounces of water and then it sends that information to a phone app, which I guess we'll get to because now the iPhone is going to finally open up Siri to third party apps. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, but the, I don't know. I just picture like, you know, how cool would it be if I could just tell any device to do something and it doesn't matter what like that the phone is actually where that process takes place hmm. siri is just sort of like the same assistant to me no matter which device i mean i, I understand to some extent there's going to be some differentiation like there are going to be some things on the mac like you can um it was kind of cool when like the, the finder searching stuff like find me files from last week from ken mm -hmm. i don't know that was Pretty cool, and then you can like drag and drop the search results right into the body of an email. Yeah, I think that was the part that I was excited about because, like, my real my realistic part of me, you know, thought kind of similar to what we were talking about before is like, okay, so most of the time I use a Mac. I'm in the office, so I'm not going to be talking to my computer that often, just because it would be awkward. But um, you know, I feel like I'll, I'll go into a, a closet do a couple Siri dictations and then save the ones that are really useful. And kind of the way I was looking at it was um, like one of the, one of the apps like not a lot of people use probably is automator on the Mac. And it's, you know, it's basically just like a scripting tool and you can just make it do a bunch of different things. Um, it's kind of Hazel esque in the fact that you can just like string together a couple different commands and like run a script and it does something on your Mac. But it's always been a little bit, hard to figure out and it's not very front and center. It's obviously not something they're paying any attention to. So for me, I was looking at Siri on the Mac, like a really easy automator where I just, I can say something that, you know, involves like, you know, three to five steps that would take a while to set up an automator. I can just say it and then I can save that and essentially just save like, popular things that I do on my computer and just like click them. And then it's like running an automator script. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, I actually was wondering if Siri would be able to work with the automator or with Apple scripts, mm. like Siri run this Apple script. Um, mm. it could be interesting down the road if they were able to open up some of that stuff. You might make a black hole. You know, what's funny, though, is I, I wonder if there are things they didn't announce that Siri can do in the Finder. Like, I, I mean, even just to have a file highlighted in the Finder and say, open this file with Pixelmator and then have the PDF open with a specific app that you voice command. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be cool. I would use that. I don't care if I'm in my office and there are other people in there. I would, I would just be talking to my computer all the time if it could do stuff <laughs> like that. You're a brave man. I don't think I'm going to be like Google image searching though. I don't know. I've got, I've got Alfred, you know, I can hit command space bar and just type in cute puppies and enter. And like, that's my, that's my quick web search right there. I don't think there's going to be a way to make it faster. You're not going to dictate all of your messages to your loved ones in your, in your office. Actually, there are a handful of things I do on the phone that are, that I take for granted that I might do on the Mac just because that's the thing that is in front of me. Yeah. Um, so I can see myself texting people from the Mac. I can when I'm alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, hey, so do you think, so I guess we can move to iOS, but iOS, obviously, the one of the major things that was announced was that now third-party apps will be able to access Siri. Just, just a comment on that. They didn't say that this was going to happen on the Mac too. Do you think that Mac new Mac Siri is going to also be able to work with third party apps? Well, I don't know. That doesn't sound likely. 
even if they're like in the app store? Like, uh, what if I want to say, hey, I want to send a Slack message to this person? Oh. Interesting. Oh, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I'm I'm curious. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. So, what what do you think of Siri coming to third third party apps on the iOS? I think it's pretty cool, but I honestly I need to wrap my head around it a bit more. Um, it's one of those things where it's kind of like, I, yeah, but that's not the way it was already, and I need to figure out why that change is significant. Because um, it's like, it's so close to something like. Um, you know, being able to type things into Spotlight and find a product that's in an app. So I need to figure out, like, how it's different than that. Um, I guess it's similar just using Siri. It seemed like from the demos they showed that it is going to require a little bit of a syntax to it. Like, yeah. you're gonna, it's going to become a little wordy. Like, hey, send a WeChat message to Susan. Um, there isn't going to be a, I mean, a, a really easy way to just say like, Hey, say to Susan, you know, hi. It, and then t to later specify conversationally that you want to use the WeChat messaging app to do so. It, se it seems like you have to kind of front load the conversation with Siri so that it knows which app you're telling it to use. Like, like I want to listen to mu this song on Spotify. Like you can't just make a simple request and then have it mm -hmm. know or even prompt you which app do you want to do this on. Yeah, I need to dig into that one a bit more. I didn't, for some reason, I, I didn't immediately grasp the implications of that one during WWDC. That's going to be, I feel like, the, well, probably the single most impactful change that we saw today. If it's implemented well and if, if the performance is consistent i mean there because i do i do use siri but there are a handful of things that i would use siri for that i don't currently if i could just you know interact with the third-party apps like i would probably never open a podcast app while i was driving again i would probably just tell siri hey i want to use this podcast app of my choice to play the recent episode of this podcast here. Hmm. Um, yeah. I don't know. It seems it seems like it's got big potential. Yeah, I think it does. I don't. I guess I don't use a ton of third party apps. I never think of it. Maybe that's why it wasn't striking me. Oh, I, I'm. It's going to be great. I, I use most of the Apple apps, but I I don't know. I'm just trying to think. I'm looking at my home screen on my iPhone. What are third party apps that I would? use Siri for? I would probably use it for Overcast, my um, podcast player. I would probably use it for Tweetbot, which is a Twitter client. Um, I would probably use it for Slack. I, oh my gosh, you could run workflows with Siri. <laughs> you know the, oh, the, uh, that's yeah. next level. <laughs> I mean, gosh, like if the workflow people implement it, you can create a really intense string of actions that your iPhone can complete and then trigger it with a couple of words. Wow, that would be amazing. Actually, that's a great example. Um, you could, I mean, what if this? What if this is like a, a way that you could, kind that the people at Google could kind of get around with this like limitation of hey of uh, Google now not being able to run on a system level. What if I could say, hey Siri, um, ask, ask <laughs> hey Google, Siri, hey Google, <laughs> ask Google what what the weather is going to be like. Um, that's hilarious. Hey Siri, go get Google. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, I mean, I, I don't know. And then, and then it's funny. I think about the people who probably will be really slow to implement it. Like, I'd love to be able to tell my phone to control the temperature in my the temperature in my house, which if Nest were HomeKit enabled, I would be able to do now. But it is not. Hmm. But you've got to think. Like, come on, guys. Like, just make some Siri interaction, and boom, that problem is solved. Yes, unfortunately, it's always harder than it seems on the uh, on the development side. I know, I know. I could say to my coffee tracking app, I just drank eight ounces of coffee. I could say, take a day one journal entry and say, blah, 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 blah. Um, I could say, um, give me a metronome uh, at 62 beats per minute. 
Um, show me my website analytics. I don't know. I'm just like looking at apps and thinking of things that I could trigger with my voice. Hmm. Um, I, you know, I want to hear um, concert pitch B flat and then have a tuning app just start humming a, a note. I don't know. There's all sorts of cool potential. You're officially cooler than I am. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm not sure what I would do. Hey, Siri, apply filters to my dog pictures and put it on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Nice. Very nice. Um, well, that was a thing that they talked about. They talked about photos. Oh, man. The photo stuff, in all seriousness, I do take a lot of photos. And I was super jazzed about um, several of those features. Advanced computer vision. It's not machine learning. It's deep learning. They made sure to use a different series of words than Google used to describe this. Yeah, they used a lot of uh, – there was a lot more like artificial intelligence talk than I expected from an Apple keynote. Yeah, so basically, for those who don't know, Google has an app called Photos, which can learn what's in your photos and create meaning out of them. So you can say, like, I want to see pictures of dogs or a snowstorm from last year. And it can basically, like, identify photos that fit that description. So Apple is now saying that they're going to be able to identify places, objects, scenes, and people in photos um, I think it's great. Do you think this is going to work well? Hmm. If I take perfect photos of mountains and horses, maybe. <laughs> I don't um, know. I want to believe that they can just snap their fingers and have a, a Google photo competitor, but I, I don't know. I don't know if I, I see mean, this being reliable. I mean, I, th you know, photos is such a big thing for Apple. So I, I feel like they wouldn't release it until it worked you know, you know, really well. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, but I do. I was joking, but I do have I do have hope that it will work well. Um, just because I mean, it's it's something that's been around for a while now, like pro just processing an image to figure out what it is. So I feel like they should be able to do a good job. Um, bringing faces in was pretty interesting in that realm. Um, I think that'll help because that's just a such an easy way of finding a photo that you want because it's essentially just a filter. Um, so that'll be cool. Yeah, I think so. I hope it is reliable. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a huge feature to announce. I mean, it, on top of, I mean, the Siri stuff would have been enough for me, but then the photo thing. And then the, the next one I have on my list is um, Maps, which, thank goodness, you can now pan and zoom and a map while you're receiving turn-by-turn -turn directions. Yeah, that, that one has always made me so mad. Like, you try and move it, and it, like, immediately snaps back. Yeah. Um, I love the color in the new Maps app. Yeah, me too. It was really pretty. Um, it can find gas stations and restaurant stops en route, so, like, you can be dry. I've always wanted this feature. Um, yeah. I don't even know if Google Maps does this, but it's always frustrating to me that I can't just say, hey, I need gas, but don't stop telling me where I'm supposed to end up. Just yeah. like take me to the gas. Detour. Right. Um, and then this is crazy. This, has got, this is what got me pumped. Like they're opening the Maps app up to developers so that people like, like um, OpenTable can make like an like a little extension where you can like be tapping on a restaurant and then right from, from within the maps app, you can start getting a reservation or you can get an Uber ride. There's like an Uber extension to get a ride to where you're going instead of driving directions. Yeah. I thought the, I thought the maps thing was totally insane. Um, which kind of like capped off a lot of the changes as like kind of all fitting under this like contextual umbrella. I felt, I felt there was a lot of, of changes that just had to do with context, whether it was like, I mean, obviously I should be able to like book a reservation once I'm looking at it on the map and it's like, that's the context that I would expect to do it. Um, there was a couple of other things that were like super contextual. Um, where is it? I mean, I guess it's kind of like some going back to the photo stuff too. It's all very contextual. So it's like, you know, it's putting you in the context of, of time. It's putting you in the context of a place, um, of a person. 
and kind of like even the fact that they even called it memories was really really interesting to me i was like thinking about that and i was like wow that's pretty it's not just a feature at that point it's like you're significantly changing the way a person recalls good moments in their life and that's that's like really that's a big thing um again it's not just like a feature it's like you're actually changing the way a person is you know remembering their life (laughs) yeah yeah i think that's cool and again it's kind of it does come back to that um artificial intelligence being able to make those decisions you know to create meaning based on sort of drawing together all this different information that's on your phone Uh um but i'm I'm just kind of pumped i don't know i just like to, to think about like what cool things can my maps app do now that third party developers can add to it yeah that's pretty incredible um i really do like the apple maps app i I've been trying to use it more. I mean, frankly, it's like it just still kind of comes down to like the quality of the actual directions. Um, but hopefully, that's something they're going to keep improving because that. I mean, what we're you know seeing today makes it pretty worth using the app. Yeah, I would imagine in New York, the directions are probably pretty solid. You'd think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh. You would think so. Um, it's really just the the driving directions are fine but it's the transit directions that are still very lacking like it's pretty common for new yorkers to check like three different transit apps anytime they want to go anywhere and i'm always amazed at how bad the results are on apple maps huh that's unfortunate yeah like it's totally wacky like some sometimes it will give you a route that like completely doesn't even make sense <laughs> so i'm gonna wait maybe a maybe six months and give it another try Hmm. All right. Well, report back. All right. <laughs> so I'll let you know if I keep getting lost. Um, I don't know. I'm going out of order on my list now. But just speaking of like my enthusiasm about uh, extensions, um, so the phone and the Messages app are getting extensions, which I think is very cool. So basically, like a third-party app like Skype will be able to get system features of the phone um like for example like it'll show like if you're calling me from skype it'll show me your picture on the oh yeah yeah. um oh and it even said like missed skype calls will show up in the phone app as missed calls which is cool uh gosh so much stuff uh voicemail transcriptions kind of like what google voice does um yeah so that's cool just the idea that all of my different phone call apps can can kind of aggregate underneath the phone app. Like this is kind of for me, like the dream. Um, They almost took it as far with messages there. It seems like they're adding kind of like little mini apps that you can install within messages that can add some of the features of some of the third party apps. Like you could have um, stickers from Facebook messenger or from line Mm -hmm. or WeChat. Um, of course, they, they didn't take it to my all-time dream, which is to just make messages a client where I can like have all of my chats aggregated in one place. Hmm. Of course, that's probably... I, I've given up on that dream at this point. Yeah, that's definitely a dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, but gosh, like that's going to be pretty cool. Like Messages got... It what felt like 40 minutes of, <laughs> of time in the keynote. Like They talked about it a really long time. Yeah, messages was like completely insane. Like I couldn't honestly the thing again just like coming from the perspective of you know working at a, a mobile agency, I just couldn't believe how hard everything they showed was was to build. Like I was every single thing. I was like sure you're showing me like this really fun sticker thing, but I'm like that probably took months to build. I mean, messages is probably their most used app. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, stuff is crazy. So, well, okay. So first of all, these, these extensions and messages don't have to, they're not just like message tools, like uh, other apps can integrate. Like you can like square cash can make an extension where I can like send, I can basically text you money. Mm -hmm. Um, again, I think open table was when they used, like you can set up reservations with someone for a restaurant right from within messages. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. But then there's the other stuff you're mentioning that, that's crazy. Like, first of all, there's all this these new animations. I, trying to watch this all unfold, I felt like it was like me trying to learn Snapchat as a 30-year-old <laughs> all over again. So true. I mean, so many bright colors and, and animated fun things. Honestly, like, I, I can see why someone, like, could be kind of a curmudgeon about it, but it all looked really fun to me. Like, I'm kind of pumped about yeah, I had a few. I had a few coworkers being like, "Oh, this looks bloated," but I was like, "This actually looks amazing," and people are gonna flip out and use all of these ridiculous effects, <laughs> including me and my mom. Yeah, totally. And it seems like most of them just happen instantly and then kind of get out of the way. Yeah, <laughs> I love the full screen effects. I mean, those were the ones that were getting the most reactions amongst my coworkers, and I was like, "Are you kidding me? I'm gonna throw balloons at people all the time now." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, gosh, looks like so much fun. I don't even know if there's time to go over every single one of them. Um, yeah, I have way, I have like a gigantic list. I don't even know where to begin either. I feel like I haven't even begun. <laughs> I mean, what do you, so when I, when I saw the stickers in particular, my first thought was kind of like what I thought about and said earlier about Siri is like, there's, I was just thinking to myself, like, who's going to be that one app developer who holds out on this? like forever or for like a year after everyone else does it. Like, like I'm going to have line stickers. I'm going to have WeChat stickers. It's going to be probably Facebook. It's going to be like, Nope, we're not doing that. We're Facebook. <laughs> and they're going to withhold all their fun stickers. I don't know why, why that's the scenario I thought of in this, in this like theory, but I don't know. I just thought to myself, like there's so many cool things that could happen. We just have to see if, developers are actually going to make it happen. True. Well, like you said, it's the most used app, so it would be a prime place to put your your time and energy. Yeah. Gosh, I'm just going... Now I'm just kind of bull, like blazing through my list here. Um, I had a whole miscellaneous section. Oh, share... They've just said this for a second. You can share notes in the notes app with other people. Oh now. my gosh, I exploded when they said that. That looks amazing. That is like the only reason that and automatic OCR is the are the only two reasons I'm still hanging on to Evernote for anything. Yeah. Um I like I, I was actually thinking like me like you and I would be sharing a doc right now if we had that feature. Right, exactly. <laughs> yep. Um, Man. that's, I mean, my wife and I just planned a whole trip. We're going to Europe in a week and we just planned our whole trip in ever, an Evernote shared notebook. And gosh, nice. it's just so, it's so, it's just so bloated. Like no, there's nothing elegant or easy or fun about using Evernote. And yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, we would probably have to sacrifice a couple of power user features to do something like what we did in Evernote with the notes app. But mm -hmm. I think I would rather do it like creating our itinerary and like embedding flight email links to flight tickets and maps of stuff. Like, I don't know, it would all just be so much more elegant and efficient in the maps. I'm sorry, in the Apple notes app. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love notes. Notes is my, probably my, one of my favorite iOS apps. So all the love they give it, I'm excited about. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Uh, let me see. Let me pick a few off my list of one million different things I was excited about. Um, two that are really simple, but I feel like are really going to change the way you use your phone. Um, Raised to Awake was amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't even know. So that's, this just means that, you, that lift, is it. you lift up your phone and it turns on the lock screen. Yeah, that's so awesome. I mean, yeah, that's just great. Um, and then... Accepting a calendar invite from the lock screen. That is incredible. Yep. Like, it's so funny to me how difficult it is to accept a calendar invite these days. It's like I get, it's like there's one quadrillion calendar invites getting sent on iPhones every day. And they're still just like super clunky to accept like a, a Google calendar invite on from an email. And it's like, I thought of this example. Um, like if I'm in an email, I've read the email, and I want to delete or archive it, I will often go back to the list view and then use like the nice little quick swipe gesture mm -hmm. 
Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, I, I'll actually leave the email to do something with it just because I like the swipe gesture so much. And I feel like I feel like this is how I'm going to accept all calendar invites now. Like, I'll do whatever it takes to, to go back to the notification and accept it from there. Yeah, I can see that. Well, sometimes, like, the most delightful solution is the best solution. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it just interact the interactive notifications in general look awesome. Like they're so colorful and contextual. One of the ones they mentioned in passing was that if you have a camera in your home or like a doorbell camera, which we actually just bought a Ring doorbell camera and it's fantastic, by the way. Um, they didn't specifically mention the manufacturer, but they showed a, a doorbell camera. Mm-hmm. Like that, where you could actually get a live video feed of what, what it was, who was in front of it, like on the lock screen instantly. And I was like, oh my gosh, because we use the Ring doorbell and it's great. And I feel like this is the ultimate first world problem. But like, even on my 6S Plus iPhone, I'm like getting the notification that someone's at my door. Okay, now I'm swiping it. Okay, now the app is loading. Okay, now it's pulling up the image. Like, I don't know. I just, <laughs> can you imagine just like lifting your phone in the air and then having a live feed of who's in front of your door visible to yeah, you? Yeah, like you didn't even have to touch anything. That's amazing. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, the lock screen is amazing. Um, one question I have. I saw someone tweet this, and I can't figure out the answer. So on the, on the lock screen, you can obviously interact with notifications. You can swipe left to get to the camera, which is pretty cool. You can swipe right to to get to like your widgets. So, is the, is swipe to unlock gone? Um, good question. So, I I guess the alternative would be that you just touch your. I guess you just press the home button. Yeah, but like, I maybe it's swipe up. Like, if I feel like you need a way to get to that to get to like the number pad. Um. To the number pad? What do you mean? Like to put in your passcode. Oh, I see. Um, I don't know. I'm just guessing you will have to press the home button. Hmm. You'd be right. That's weird. That's been there for since day one. I know. I know. Well, it's going to be really weird to not have to touch anything to see your lock screen. That That is very strange. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, touching stuff, I mean, actually, like, you, you'll actually, like, Touching the phone for the first time will be to actually interact with something that your phone is doing, not just to basically like wake it up. So it makes sense. But that is a fundamental change. That is going to kind of mess with people for the first couple times they try to unlock their mm-hmm. phone. Yeah. I mean, that's like been ingrained in people for years. I also, because of Touch ID, I don't actually ever do the swipe. Um, yeah, me neither. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I use the passcode on my iPad Pro because sometimes I'm holding it in a weird way where, like, mm. touching my finger to the Touch ID sensor is awkward. Yeah, that's true. I actually really like to, like, cradle it in portrait mode on, in my left <laughs> arm and then, like, interact with it with the Apple Pencil. Mm, very, like, Bob Ross of you. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Well, we should like say a fake goodbye so that I can like have a, a, log- a logical close into this episode, and then um, then we should, you know, actually, you know, because I don't want to like say, well, that's the show, and then hang up on you. Oh, actually, one piece of um, of housekeeping, because I guess I guess when you uh, my podcast deserves some housekeeping, even though I haven't done an episode in like six months, um, there will be. There is a very exciting fall mini series planned on this podcast where I am going to be dissecting each chapter of my forthcoming book, Digital nice. Organization Tips for Music Teachers. And yeah, I'm, I thought it would be fun to, uh, when the book releases, to do um, an episode each week where I have a different guest on who is sort of an expert on that topic of the chapter and then just kind of like dissect I don't know kind of like a commentary on the book but just Mm -hmm. sort of distributed you know weekly by weekly 
Um, so that's going to happen around September. Um, but I'm pretty, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Should nice. Well, I'm in. Yeah. Um, so WWDC, you can watch the, the keynote on Apple's website. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to these changes. This was fun. Good stuff, Robbie. I'm going to fake say goodbye to you now. All right. Adios. See ya. See ya.